Hey everybody, I'm Robert Donovan. Welcome to this episode of Not Treconomics. High school, four years of college, hobby degree that nobody will pay you for, and emerging with an average of $35,051 in debt, and no job. You get, a man, you get a bare subsistence job at or just slightly above minimum wage in something other than the field your degree is for, Incur all the costs for food, rent, slash mortgage, clothes, shelters, gas, car, insurance, and oh, along the way you meet that special someone. You get married, finance the wedding on credit cards, have a kid or two, thereby add costs of extra food, diapers, pediatric care, and general child rearing to cover the bills you and take care of the kids. Both you and your spouse must work. Uh, one of you part-time. A year later, you get a 3% raise and a few more hours at work. Unfortunately, you had to miss a few payments during the year, and the accumulated fees and interest added to your various payments soak up most of the raise you got. Your future now revolves entirely around meeting the demands of a dead-end job to enrich bankers, landlords, merchants, and employers. Heck, sounds like it's about time to go shopping for a house. About this point in the scenario above, you're probably feeling about like Quark did, uh, if you were experiencing this, uh, you would be feeling about like Quark did on DS9 after he fell afoul of the Ferengi Commerce Authority and couldn't pay his debts. The absence of money in the Federation and Star Trek makes most debts take the form of favors rather than monetary obligations. Uh, the downside being uh, that if you renege on a deal with the Klingons, just paying them back the money is never an option. Now, I'm going to talk about the other debts in the next video, but I want to start with student loan debt. That is the debt that would be considered indentured servitude in any other context. Now, as of 2015, the latest numbers I could find, total student loan debt was $1.2 trillion. 40% of people in the U.S. have student loans, 68% of bachelor's degree graduates have student loan debt, and an average monthly payment of 300 bucks. Now, an average balance uh, for those bachelors is $35,051. Now, in 2013, interestingly, 36,000 people had part of their Social Security checks garnished due to student loans. That's a 500% increase from 2002, and this is all as of 2013 to 2015, so I'll be very surprised if those numbers are not even worse and understate the case as of 2017 when this video is being recorded. Now, you read any article decrying the student loan crisis, and a common thread in all of them is that the idea that money spent to repay student loans isn't available for spending on conspicuous consumption, which is kind of funny when you, re when you realize that aggregate corporate debt runs to the tune of $29 trillion. So your lack of a future as you toil and scrape to pay off your crippling student loan debt for decades threatens the bottom line of the big corporations who need you to go out and spend stupidly so they can pay off their debts and recover their bottom line. Oh, what they mean by bottom line is they call it the economy. All right, now add to that the fact that banks make most of their money on loan defaults, or it's actually not so much the banks, but the servicers, the service companies that manage the mortgages for the banks, make most of their money on loan defaults. And one might conclude that the easiest way to get back at the banks and hurt the big corporations is to pay your debts off fast and refuse to use debt anymore. Our debt-addicted society is poised to reckon with one simple fact, the money to pay back debt comes out of your future earnings and prosperity. If you lack sufficient economic value to offer in trade, you can easily wind up in a kind of voluntary servitude, trading away all the output you'll ever produce for the rest of your life before you ever get it. Now, for any other kind of debt, the remedy for that situation would be bankruptcy. That's why the bankruptcy laws replace debtor's prison. Alas, student loans are largely denied that remedy, but as it turns out, maybe not as entirely as we might have been led to believe. Now, I said previously that student loan debt, in a previous video I said this, that it can't be discharged via bankruptcy. Well, I've done some further research, and it turns out that it is actually not impossible, just really, really hard. Even so, 
According to a study in 2011 by a guy named Jason Iuliano, as many as 40% of students may be able to discharge some or all of their student loan debts via bankruptcy. According to that study, the biggest reason that the discharge of student loan debt is so rare is that students think that discharge via bankruptcy is impossible. Gee, why would they think that? I wonder if the banks are telling people that when they get behind. No, nah, they would never do that. And as a result, the students never even try. Now, I urge anyone strapped with student debt, because I am not a lawyer, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm a bankrupt guy living out of his van, so taking any of this as advice from me, you, the tragedy will befall you if that's all you've got. And I don't want to be responsible for that. So I would urge you, though, not to assume the worst and talk to a bankruptcy attorney, and in particular, talk to a bankruptcy attorney who specializes in student loan debt bankruptcies. That's pretty much all they do for a living, because they will know the ins and outs and subtle nuances that a more general practitioner probably will not. So what do you need in general? And again, I'm not a lawyer, so, but this is what the, the law says you need uh, in to discharge student loan debt via Chapter 7 bankruptcy. This is for the U.S. I have no idea what it was would be like in other countries. Um, but bankruptcy requires that you file something called an adversary proceeding, which is basically a lawsuit within the bankruptcy, alleging that repaying your loan would cause an undue financial hardship. Now, whether you succeed in proving that, according to Eliano, can depend an awful lot on the judge you get and the experience of your attorney, but there have been cases where people successfully did this themselves. The more complex your case, the more I would recommend you get an attorney uh, because they will understand how to present the thing so that it's, it, it has the best chance of being well received by the court. The most commonly applied hardship test, though, is something called the Brunner Standard, which requires you to prove three things. First, that you can't maintain a minimum standard of living. How that's defined, I have no idea, based on your current income and expenses. That this state of affairs, the second thing you have to prove is that this state of affairs is persistent, long term, for a significant portion of the debt repayment uh, time frame of your loan. And that you have made a good faith effort to repay the loans. That's the third thing. Now, failing Chapter 7, Chapter 13, reorganization, is your other option. Now, Chapter 13 has a couple of advantages. One, the court, not the bank, determines your payments, which can be a big plus. It can get your payments down to something you can afford, another big plus. Collection activity stops until your case is settled. Student loans are considered non-priority unsecured debts, which means you may not have to pay them off in full as part of your bankruptcy plan. Again, consult an attorney on all of this, because I am not one. But getting rid of your other debts, but basically if you file a 13 or a 7, throw your student loan debt into it, and if the student loan debt can't be discharged, your other debts still could be. So you may wind up having only your student loan debt to pay as opposed to your student loan debt and a whole bunch of other debts. Chapter 13, the same thing would happen. Um, the, but getting rid of your other debts may make your student loan debt more affordable. Chapter 13 has a couple of disadvantages in, with student loan debt in that normally in a Chapter 13, when you finish your three to five year payment plan, all your debts not paid off get discharged. With student loan debt, it can't be discharged. So what happens is the interest will still accrue. You still have to pay back whatever your uh, student loan debt remains at if, you, if you don't pay it off as part of your payment plan. Because with the Chapter 13, you may not have to pay your debts off in full as part of your payment plan. Same thing with a student loan debt. But because student loan debt doesn't get discharged after your payment plan is done, the interest you'll still have to pay the accumulated interest and still pay off the remainder of the debt. Okay, because not dischargeable. Okay, and the other disadvantage with any bankruptcy, Chapter 13 or Chapter 7, is that you have to front up front the cost of the bankruptcy attorney because that's not a thing lawyers tend to do pro bono for what should be painfully obvious reasons. All right, now the odds of getting a discharge, while not good, I would hasten to add, are going to be zero if you do not try. So if you file Chapter 7 or 13 to clear out your other debts, Throw in the student loans and try to get them discharged, at least some of it, too. 
You can still get your other debts discharged, even if the student loan debt cannot be. You could also try the traditional refinancing stuff you would do with other loans if, if you don't want to do bankruptcy, if you're not quite that far in the hole, such as consolidation, renegotiation, and converting to a private loan. Deciding which to do really requires that you talk to a lender who specializes in student loan debt situations. Again, they will know the ins and outs and little tricks that a generalist will not be aware of. The big problem with the consolidation approach is that a loan from the Department of Education offers more payment options than a private lender does. So again, check with an attorney and or lender who specializes in student loan debt because sorting all this out can be ridiculously complex and it's based on a lot of different, it, it, a lot of different variables have to be taken into account. But speaking of those other payment options, the department of the, one of the, one of the things you lose if you do a consolidation or a refi, you lose a couple of things you get if you keep your loan under the Department of Education and that they offer income-based contingent income or pay-as-you-earn repayment plans in which you pay a percentage of your income for 20 to 25 years, depending on the plan and your situation, and anything not paid off after that is discharged. But unlike a bankruptcy, the discharge portion is still considered taxable income. So the takeaways here. Don't assume student loan debt can't be discharged in bankruptcy just because it's hard. Seek an attorney specializing in student loan debt bankruptcies and get the facts for your jurisdiction. Don't just trust me. Don't trust anything you read. Talk to an attorney who's actually licensed and certified and uh, specializes in your state in student loans. So consider Chapter 7 and Chapter 13. Consult a lender if you're going to do the other non Chapter 7, Chapter 13s, consider a lender who specializes in student loan debt situations and do the math on the loan conversions, consolidations, and renegotiations so you don't wind up paying more and losing payment options in the bargain. So refinancing student loan debts, by the way, does not make it dischargeable. That's one of the myths that's running around the internet and it's not true. That's why lenders are so eager to offer you a deal on them because they know you can't discharge them and they can garnish your social security if they want, as 36,000 people found out the hard way in 2013. Consider income-based pay-as-you-go, pay-as-you-earn, and uh, contingent repayment plans. None of these plans are as good as bankruptcy, but until the laws are changed to allow student loans once again to be discharged via bankruptcy, and I think they should, they are all worth looking into. From a post-satiety standpoint, by far your best option is to just avoid student loan debt completely, consider going to college only for a degree in a STEM field, or uh, and college may not even be necessary for non-STEM or art fields these days, so don't assume you need to go if it's not a profession where the government requires you to have that degree in order to practice like a doctor or a lawyer, or a STEM field where you really do need to go, if nothing else, to get access to some really expensive equipment to learn how to you know, do, the, do the stuff you do in those things. Um, but don't assume you need to go to college. That's, the first, the, that's one of the big things about avoiding debt in the first place. But for those who are already ensnared in a student loan debt, I would recommend prioritizing paying it off first because the difficulty in discharging it through bankruptcy makes it one of the most toxic and dangerous types of debt there is. And also there are organizations you can Google, there's one called Student Loan Ranger There's a that you can, you can look for organizations that are trying to lobby Congress as advocates for making it dischargeable through bankruptcy as it was before I think 1978. The links below are there. I've got some links below to that kind of information. And in the next episode, we're going to be looking at specific strategies and methods for paying debt down faster. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this information useful and may the balance of your day be awesome.